This video will contain spoilers for Jujutsu Kaisen chapters 64, 79, and 80, and Season 2, Episode 6, otherwise known as Episode 30. There will be hints for the upcoming arc, but no explicit spoilers. So the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen is back, and in this series, I'm going to be analyzing the story of the series as it airs and, as a manga reader, comparing the anime to the manga to see what they pulled over directly, what they modified or expanded, and what they just straight up removed. So let's begin with the sixth episode of Season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen. First, I'll recap the plot and explain what chapters it covered. We begin with a scene depicting Yuji, Megami, and Nobata returning from their mission at the end of the previous season. Fun fact, in the manga, this chapter is actually placed before the flashback arc the anime just finished up, so the anime team decided to move it to here, which works for pacing reasons, but maybe makes this a little confusing as to when these events were supposed to have occurred. Anyway, Yuji wants to see a movie, Nobara wants to go shopping, and Megumi decides to go home. Yuji tries to rope Nobara into seeing the movie, having decided to see Human Senta, uh, the, uh, Human Earthworm 4. The plot actually kind of seems like a cross between Human Centipede and The Shape of Water. Anyway, she turns him down and leaves to go shopping, which in the manga she explicitly name drops Givenchy, so clothes shopping. And we see as a young woman seems to be watching from afar, whilst seeming somewhat distracted from her environment. Next, we get a small recap of Aoi, Toro, and Meimei putting the Tokyo students up for promotion, and then a little insert scene that sheds more light on that. Toto and Mei are playing table tennis, slash ping pong, and discussing how the progression from grade 2 sorcerer to semi-grade 1, and then to grade 1 works. Obviously, they're discussing this because Toto and Mei nominated our three protagonists, Itadori Yuji, Fushiguro Megumi, and Kugisaki Nobara, as well as Zenin Maki and Panda for promotion to grade 1. It seems as though Toto misunderstood the assignment and didn't realize that the missions a sorcerer goes on to achieve semi-grade 1 after nomination cannot be undertaken with the person who nominated them, as he seems a bit put out that his plan to undergo more missions with Itadori by nominating him isn't going to work out. Then we cut back to the Nobara situation, and see as the young woman stops her and asks if she knows Itadori. After the slick new opening, which I already love, the two talk in a cafe, and the woman, Ozawa Yuko, shows Nobara the picture she took with Itadori at middle school graduation. She looks a fair bit different now, which she attributes to having a growth spurt and the stress of moving to Tokyo. She also thinks that with her new look, she could potentially catch Itadori's attention, which Kugisaki confirms with grim seriousness, a sentiment that Ozawa returns. Kugisaki decides that Fushiguro needs to meet Ozawa since he knows Itadori better than her. Ozawa asks if Kugisaki likes Itadori, which she vehemently denies, claiming even if the heavens and earth were to dance, it wouldn't make her change from her anti-Itadori stance, though she immediately experiences a heart palpitation. At this moment, Fushiguro arrives, irritated to be summoned in such a way. Kugisaki, ignoring his attitude, asks if Itadori has a girlfriend. Fushiguro is confused, so Kugisaki explains the situation. Aghast, Fushiguro continues the trend of realizing Ozawa likes Itadori with grim seriousness. He explains that between Itadori's amenability to moving to Tokyo and the kinds of posters he has up in his room, he's pretty sure Itadori is single. Kugisaki makes a comment about Fushiguro drinking black coffee to impress girls, but he insists he just likes black coffee. Ozawa interrupts to ask if Fushiguro happens to know what type of girl Itadori likes, and Fushiguro confirms that he likes tall girls. Ozawa and Kugisaki share a glance and clink their glasses together in triumph. Kugisaki asks if Ozawa wants her to invite Itadori, and Ozawa confidently agrees. After a hilariously short text conversation, Itadori agrees to come. In seconds, he arrives carrying a paper bag. Kugisaki has a mini panic upon realizing that she hasn't told Itadori about Ozawa yet, who probably won't recognize her with such a big change to her appearance, and how hurtful it would be to hear words of irrecognition from the one that you like. Fushiguro asks what the paper bag is for, and Itadori explains he couldn't find a cash exchange, so he traded in for prizes, low-key admitting he didn't actually go see a movie, but was instead at a pachinko parlor, which he shouldn't have been, by the way, since he's underage. When Kugisaki interjects to introduce Ozawa, her fears were pointless, as Itadori immediately recognizes Ozawa, despite her change in appearance. 
Fushiguro and Kugisaki are impressed, awarding him solid tens. In a flashback, we see Ozawa listen in on a conversation between Itadori and some of his classmates in middle school. The boy asks Itadori if he likes any girls, and he says Ozawa. They make fun of him for liking a fat girl, but he defends himself by saying that he finds it impressive how she eats fish, since it's so hard, and likes how elegant her handwriting is. The boys ask about him liking tall girls with big asses, and he exclaims that that's something different. Ozawa explains that she wouldn't like someone who doesn't like her, which is why she likes Itadori, but by being concerned about her appearance and whether Itadori would like her concerning it, she realizes she's acting just like the people she doesn't like. Anyway, the group parts with her, to which Fushiguro asks if it was okay to just leave her there. Kugisaki explains that she exchanged contact info with her, so it should be fine. More importantly though, she realized when her heart skipped a beat that she hates the idea of Itadori getting a girlfriend before she gets a boyfriend, which Fushiguro responds to with nonchalant incredulity. After the ad break, we see Utahime in a parking structure, and we get a little recap to remind us that Gojo and Utahime suspect a mole at one of the Jujutsu schools. We see Megumi, Nobata, and Yuji walking through the structure with Utahime. Utahime explains that they've come to the conclusion that there are two moles feeding intel to the curses. One is higher up, probably even higher than Principal Gakuganji, bringing Utahime to conclude that there's nothing they can do about them. However, she continues to say that someone closer to the students must be feeding the higher up info, and they now have a good idea of who that might be. That being said, the individual in question is still only under suspicion, so they're to capture them and then move to interrogation. Nobara deduces that since Utahime, who is a teacher at the Kyoto school, is confiding in the students from the Tokyo branch, then the suspected individual must be from the Kyoto school, which impresses Yuji. A pall falls over Utahime's face as she starts to reveal who the mole is, but before she can say the name, we cut to Miwa entering a room looking for Mekamaru. She finds him sitting in the room, telling him that notebooks are due that day. He is slow to respond, but eventually chimes in to say that he's going to sleep for a bit and that his notebook is on the desk. Miwa complains that it's a bit early for sleep and pokes at his head to confirm he is indeed asleep, while wondering where the real Mekamaru is. That is, Kokichi Muta, his actual body. We cut back to Utahime, leading the Yugumibara trio to where Kokichi Muta's real body is located explaining that they only suspect him due to process of elimination and not due to any particularly suspicious actions on his part. Utahime explains that due to Muta's heavenly restriction, his puppet manipulation technique has an expanded reach that covers the entire nation, making it very easy for him to use unregistered puppets that collect information so he can act as a spy. Yuji, only being familiar with the main body of Mekamaru, assumes they would all look like that and says he thinks it would be pretty obvious if that's what Muta was doing. Utahime asks if it would be as obvious if the puppets were as small as a fly or a mosquito, cluing Yuji and the audience in that his puppets can take more than one form, and they arrive at a door Utahime indicates as the spot. We see Muta react to the presence of someone as the group enters the room. Yuji is surprised as the room is empty save for a chair, and Utahime claims that Muta got them. Megumi and Nobara point out that this confirms Mekamaru as the mole, given that he gave them a false location to throw them off his trail. We see Muta complain to whoever he's speaking to about how long it took them to come for him, wondering if they'd forgotten about him. Geto states that they would never, given the nature of the deal they've made. With him is Mahito, who wants to kill Muta now that since they've reached the end of the deal and he is now their enemy. Geto admonishes him, reminding Mahito that they made a binding vow with Muta for Mahito to use Idol Transfiguration to heal Muta's body in exchange for his spy work, and that Mahito can kill him after completing his end of the vow. Geto laments the loss of using him in Shibuya, while Muta chimes in to accuse him of breaking the vow first since one part of it was that they wouldn't lay a finger on anyone from Kyoto Jujutsu High. Mahito brushes off the accusation, claiming that it was allowed because Hanami was the one who did all the fighting. Muta expresses his distaste for Mahito and then tells him to just get done what he came here to do. Mahito threatens to turn Muta into a caterpillar, but Geto admonishes him again. He teaches him that a binding vow between two people is especially dangerous to break, because the penalty is unknown. When one creates a binding vow with oneself, the worst that can happen is the loss of whatever was gained from the vow. In contrast, breaking a vow with another person can incur an unknown penalty that could also come at an unknown time, and they can't afford to take that risk. Mahito relents, and proceeds to use idle transfiguration to heal Muta's body while calling him scum. Muta tests his newly healed body, 
but Mahito is unimpressed by his lack of enthusiasm. Muta says there will be time for that after they conclude their business, which Mahito agrees to and assumes a fighting stance. Muta responds by revealing several of his puppets stationed in the room. Geto asks if Mahito needs help, but Mahito acts possessive towards Muta, referring to him as his toy. Muta sicks several of his puppets on Mahito, and Mahito grows his arm to a giant size, Super Mario 64 style, and sweeps it across the room to take out the puppets. With his view clear, Mahito notices Muta's disappearance. He assumes Muta ran away, since he has no reason in particular to kill them. He complains that he doesn't feel like hunting and just wants to fight, as the floor crumbles beneath his feet. We cut to outside, revealing that the room they were in was underneath a dam, and see a giant explosion of water geyser into the sky. Kinda cool that this scene is set under a cloudy sky, maybe near dusk. I always imagined it was during a sunny day when I read the manga. Mahito emerges and lands on the wall of the dam, expressing his excitement. Before him stands a giant mech version of Mechamaru, which Muta calls Ultimate Mechamaru Mode Absolute. Mahito assumes he must have found the time to build something like that with all his free time being a shut-in, and makes note that the concentration of Muta's spirit is in his head, meaning that there must be a cockpit there he's located in, to keep Mahito away from touching him. We see as Muta mans the cockpit, and takes note that Geto dropped a veil that's stopping all outgoing cell and cursed energy signals, so Muta can't call for backup. His plan relies on Gojo, either emailing him, calling him, running away to him and bringing the two adversaries with him, or using his Mekamaru puppet with Miwa to tell her to contact Gojo. He notes that even if he were to focus on Geto to try and drop the veil, Mahito would still be an extreme threat, so he has no choice but to exercise Mahito first. He looks over to Geto, who notices his attention, makes a gesture, and says, Don't mind me, please continue. Muta thinks there's a low chance he can win, but a chance nonetheless, as he's seen all the preceding events involving these guys, which show up as images in his cockpit, which isn't what I imagined from the manga, but is really cool. And that he's been accumulating all his excess cursed energy over the years, showing a counter in his cockpit that reveals he has about 17 and a half years worth of cursed energy built up. He thinks of Miwa, who he probably has a crush on, and decides he's going to hold nothing back. He blasts off a year's worth of cursed energy at Mahito with Ultra Cannon, and the episode ends. With the recap out of the way, let's go over the basic points of the plot. 1. We get a follow-up on the ending of the previous season, showing why the Yugumi Bara trio was out shopping when they received the call from Gojo, who was asleep when they arrived. 2. It turns out that he called them to go with Utahime to confront who they suspected to be the mole in Jujutsu High. 3. The mole turns out to be Mekamaru, real name Kokichi Muta, who made a binding vow with Geto and his disaster curses to act as a spy in exchange for Mahito giving him a normal body with idle transfiguration. 4. Having reached the end of their deal, Mahito upholds his end of the bargain, and then he and Muta proceed to fight. And 5. Revealing a giant mech version of Mechamaru, Muta's plan relies on making contact with Gojo, but Geto drops a veil that blocks all outgoing signals, forcing Muta into combat with Mahito. Now let's get into some analysis. The first thing I want to talk about is the importance of Chapter 64, the beginning part of this episode with the scenario in the diner with the trio and Ozawa. It may seem like a fluffy throwaway slice of life chapter just to add some space between the seriousness of the previous arc and the seriousness of the incoming arc. However, it actually is quite important for character development, even if that development only serves to make what's coming up in the next arc hurt even more. It offers us insight into the more mundane aspects of Yuji, Nobata, and Megumi's personalities. We learn that while Yuji proclaims to be interested in tall girls with big butts, he apparently liked Ozawa even before her physical transformation due to her elegance. This highlights a detail-oriented aspect of Yuji's character that goes against his overall depiction as a dumb muscle type, but actually reinforces the idea that while Yuji may not be book smart, he is good with people, which makes complete sense when we think back to the fact that he was one of the few people who managed to become friends with Junpei. Rest in peace despite his loner personality. Also, it shows that Yuji apparently has two different types he likes, for different reasons. Maybe something like the kind of girl he likes to see in a movie or on screen, and the kind of girl he'd actually like to be in a relationship with? 
For Nobata, we're brought closer to her here in the form of the ambiguity surrounding her heart palpitations regarding Yuji's relationship status. Of course, her statement on the matter is that she doesn't like the idea of Yuji finding a girlfriend before she finds a boyfriend, but Megumi's reaction seems to cast doubt on the statement, perhaps implying she was worried about another girl liking him. Or at least, that's the way I see it. You could also read Megumi's reaction just as simple disinterest, and her statement could be 100% straightforward and true. Speaking of Megumi, he gets some development here by illustrating that he isn't quite so above it all when it comes to what could be considered unimportant things like relationship drama. It also shows that he can extend his tactical analysis skills that we usually see him using to decipher enemy curse techniques to people's habits, for example, to deduce that Yuji is single. Regardless, the chapter ultimately serves as a nice little breather section between two more intense arcs and does just enough work to further connect the audience to the characters to make what's coming hit that much harder. Also, just a little side note, but in the text conversation between Yuji and Nobata, her chat icon is a nail, a reference to her straw doll technique, and Yuji's icon is a cat, which in the manga only has one eye, which is the avatar Akutami drew for himself to use. The second thing I want to get into here is the return of the Jujutsu Stroll, the name I've come up with for our digital field trips to see where events from Jujutsu Kaisen have taken place in the real world. This week we're looking at the dam where the fight between Mekamaru and Mahito takes place. In real life, this dam is known as the Ebata Tamaiki Dam, with the body of water it's damming being the Ebata Pond. Now the first thing I want to point out is the distance between this dam and Tokyo. I want to bring this up because Muta states his plan is to contact Gojo, who at this point I assume would be in Tokyo. Of course, with things like modern communications equipment and Muta's own remote curse technique, this distance isn't really an issue, but those get blocked and he does mention that one of his plans involves breaking out of Ghetto's Veil and physically going to where Gojo is. So first of all, the dam is about 12 hours away by car from Tokyo. So traversing that distance on foot, even in a giant mech, especially with two curse users like Mahito and Geto in pursuit, is a bit of a tall order. Like, good on him for still considering it despite its practical drawbacks, but it's so close to impossible to pull off that he might as well have just not considered it at all. The dam is at the very tail end of the central island of Japan, which is known as Honshu. The nearest large city, Kitakyushu, is actually across a bridge to the southwest on the southern island of Kyushu. Now we don't necessarily know all the details of how Gojo's teleportation works, but even if Muta could successfully contact him, would he even be able to get there fast enough to help him? Like could Gojo just teleport there? We don't know if he just teleports everywhere when he travels or if he still uses things like planes. We see him still being driven around by Ijichi, so maybe he would only use a long distance teleportation like that in an emergency which this could feasibly be. Either way, I think the simple knowledge of the distance at play here just does a good job of reinforcing to those in the know just how much of a long shot Muta's plan is here. Will he manage to make an opening to get a distress call out? Is he going to make it out of this alive? We'll have to wait and see to find out. Of course, setting the fight here so far away from where we see him interact with Miwa through one of the normal Mekamaru puppets reinforces in a subtle way the reach of Mekamaru's technique as Utahime mentions. Miwa and the puppet were most likely at the Kyoto School, which we don't know the exact location of, which is a little closer to the dam than Tokyo by about half. The drive between the Kyoto School and the dam is about six hours. That being said, if the false location he gave Utahime and the others was somewhere in Tokyo, then that means to someone familiar with his technique like Utahime, it was believable he could operate his technique from that distance. Though Utahime explicitly says Muta's technique could technically cover the whole country, the specific locations used here give anyone in the audience who is familiar, or anyone crazy enough to track the details down, a frame of reference in real world distances that's a pretty cool detail that's very easy to overlook, especially for overseas fans who aren't familiar with Japanese geography. Finally, let's get into the in-between pages of these chapters from the volume release of the manga. First, there was actually a page following chapter 65, which was the first chapter of the flashback arc which refers to the events of chapter 64, which we saw in this episode. I actually wrote about this way back in the video for episode one, but ended up cutting it out after that episode didn't adapt this chapter like I thought it might. Anyway, this page basically offers some insight into the behind the scenes proceedings on a manga, 
as Akutami talks about the implication that Yuji was at a pachinko parlor. His editor and his team as a whole told him not to do it, but he falsely agreed with them and put it in anyway. Discussion was had about changing it for the volume release, which is interesting, as usually we expect that later releases will have less censorship. But manga release schedules are so tight that a lot of times not only are the volume chapters less censored, but also corrections or changes are made. They decided to keep it in because Akutami came to the conclusion that Yuji's grandpa probably started bringing him to pachinko parlors in 6th grade, which would be around when he was 11 or 12. Not to mention, Yuji is the type of person who just clicks yes when accessing Skebe sites online that ask if you're over 18. Akutami explains that he doesn't really like Yuji, but he and Yuji share a certain lowbrow quality, which is why he lied and said he'd change it when he had no intention to. He reminds all the underage readers not to go to pachinko parlors, but that in those delinquent aspects of Yuji's personality is where his good-naturedness resides and asks readers to focus on that instead. After chapter 79, we have a character page for Toji. It mentions that he was poor and liked to wander from woman to woman, charming them so he could bum off of them. It states that his unstable personality originated when he was in the Zenin clan, but breaking away from them and being with Megami's mother helped calm him down, until she passed away, which caused him to relapse. Finally, it says that because he could fight other sorcerers effectively, but couldn't kill curses without the use of tools, he was ostracized from the Zenin clan. We didn't finish chapter 80, the episode ended midway through it, so I won't go into that one. Anyway, that's my episode recap and story analysis for the sixth episode of the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. Make sure to subscribe and turn on bell notifications if you want to be here as soon as possible each week as I put out new videos for each episode as it airs, and feel free to drop a comment with suggestions as to other videos you might like to see such as character analysis videos or explanations. Thanks for watching.